Okay, at this time, I would ask for uh, Dr. Larry Rowland to come up because it's his turn to talk. Um, we, I asked Larry for his CV, and he gave me this amazing page in this little teeny weeny print because all of his stuff wouldn't fit on one page if it wasn't in a little teeny weeny print. Uh, so um, we're real tickled to have Larry to be part of our service, and um, his, his part of his bio is in your program. He's pretty well known around town. Larry, I want you to hold this for a minute. No, it's not. It would not be there. When you, when you think about Larry's this is what you call a pot do. <laughs> this, this is what our historians do. Steve Wise, Larry Rowland, the best of the best. And so I present this evening Dr. Larry Rowland. Well, um, I have to say, uh, this is a very big story. And we have in the audience one of the real national experts on this story. Um, so when this is over, I'll introduce Dr. Chester DePratter, who many of you know. And he'll get to answer the questions that you have. <laughs> and I can sit down. But uh, Chester organized a whole conference in Florida a few years ago on the Embassy War um, with a lot of national experts. And one, one of those who came uh, was Larry Ivers, who's the author of this book, and I give him credit for a lot of the illustrations you will see today and a good deal of the information you will hear. Um, I have a chapter on the MC War in the first volume of the history of Beaufort County. Um, he wrote a whole book on it, so his has more detail, more factual information, and is a lot newer. Um, and I certainly recommend, this is called This Torrent of Indians, and it's um, published by the University of South Carolina Press last year. So I certainly recommend that if you get if you have further interest in this subject. And after this talk, you will have further interest in this subject. Um, um, there'll be a lot of maps in this because it is a um, sweeping sort of talk. Well, the Embassy War um, was probably the most consequential Indian war in colonial American history. Um, don't, don't tell anybody from Boston that. <laughs> um, but it did affect the history of the North American continent. And when we get done with this, I will conclude with what the effect might have been. Uh, the Yamasee are a Muscogean tribe. They are related to the Creek Indians of Georgia. Uh, the Creek Indians were a very large tribe, that's the orange on there, that represented, that occupied much of the area of Georgia. Uh, much of the area of Alabama, some of the Gulf Coast of Florida, um, and were one of the largest Native American groups, uh, certainly in the Southeast, probably in North America at that time. Uh, the embassy first appeared in the Spanish record um, as living uh, on the lower Alt Altamaha River of Georgia. They um, revolted against the Spaniards in 1597 in what's known as the Juanilo Revolt. And they had a big effect then. They were a particularly warlike tribe. And they massacred the uh, Franciscan missionaries and the Guale missions of the, of the Georgia coast. And as a consequence of that, the Spaniards uh, retreated to Florida. And um, for the next 200 years, nearly 200 years, there was a sort of consistent enmity between the Emissary Indians of Georgia and the Timucuan Indians of Florida who became allies of the Spanish in Florida. Well, when the English arrived in 1670 in Carolina, the Emissary, being traditional enemies of the Spaniards, uh, moved north probably for commercial reasons to be near the English. Um, and when they did, they moved into our neighborhood. Um, they engaged in the Indian trade. The Indian trade in those days was the exchange of manufactured goods brought by the English, textiles, iron tools, guns, whiskey, all sorts of things, um, for deerskin, which were a very valuable product in Europe at that time. And southern white-tailed deer uh, was really a luxury product in the leather business. Uh, this is a proto 
that this is before the Industrial Revolution when textiles were hard to make by hand and uh, a lot of people wore leather clothes. Um, there is a poem in the early 19th century that describes how an 18th century dashing gentleman would have dressed. Uh, it's called The High Women. Some of you memorized mm -hmm. this when you were children. Um, and there's a, 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 a section of that that describes how the high, high, highwayman was dressed. He said he had a French cocked hat on his head, a piece of lace at his chin, a coat of claret velvet, and breeches of brown doe skin. Well, in the 18th century, that brown doe skin came from Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. This was big business. This was the business that sustained the early English settlers of Carolina. And the Yamasee were the principal trading partners of, uh, of that trade when the English first arrived. Um, there were lots of disputes about territory and settlement, and it is a great cultural conflict that is impossible for me to describe in total here. But you have to try and imagine that uh, these were Stone Age Native Americans um, that were, they were hunter-gatherers and they were encountered by an advanced agricultural society that wanted to put lines on the land and establish private property, something the Native Americans didn't. I'll just tell you one story. Um, in the, in the 17, early 1720s, when um, John Barnwell, Colonel John Barnwell, was the magistrate in Buford, uh, some of the local militia found some Creek Indians hunting on Paris Island, which was not their land. It was private property and owned by Alexander Paris. And um, so they arrested the, they were Creek Indians from Georgia, and they arrested them and threw them in a jail somewhere in a basement on Bay Street. Now, a basement on Bay Street would pretty be dank, troublesome place. They weren't there long. Um, John Barnwell brought them out, brought them forth before the dock, the dock, and, uh, and um, said, well, do you understand? They, they asked what the crime was. They said, well, you were hunting on private property. And they said, what's private property? He said, well, this is land owned by somebody else. And their answer was, well, isn't the land free, like the air and the water? John Barnwell had no answer to that. So he put it back in their canoe and told them to go back to Georgia, which they did. But it just represents the conflict of that era between two very different cultures and very, two very different histories. Well, the embassy put themselves in the middle of this conflict for commercial reasons. And the trade changed Native American culture. They became dependent on the products that the English brought them. Uh, and the English kept raising the prices and offering um, credit to Native Americans who had no concept of, of compound interest or debt. Uh, Native Americans tended to collect their debts by splitting your head with a stone axe, you know that? So there was a, there was a, just a huge cultural conflict that eventually blew up, causing the Yamasee War. Um, but the Yamasee were for a number of years, for a generation, they were allies of the English. And um, when they moved up here in order to settle these differences, let's see if, let's see what happens here. That goes back, that goes back. Here we go. Um, let's see if I can get to that map on the right. There we go. Um, the embassy settled here. And in 1707, they signed a treaty with the English which established uh, six embassy villages in this region. Uh, the lower towns were south of the Broad River, were names that you know well. Uh, Chichesi, and Altamaha, and Okatee. If you want to know how to spell Okatee, ask me. I'll give you six different spellings, all <laughs> of um, And the upper towns, which were up near the headwaters of the Port Royal Sound, were Pocotaligo. These are all names that live with us today. Uh, Pocotaligo. Tamakli and uh, Pocosebo and Huspa. So I'm forgetting one, but um, ask Chester, he'll tell you how to talk. Um, in any case, uh, they resided here, and the, and the trade in the, in the press of the English settlement became more and more bothersome to both sides. 
uh, among other things, and, and the treaty set aside the mainland of the Beaufort District, it's always called Indian land at the colonial period, and set aside the islands for the settlement and the land granting and the surveying and the settling of the English settlers. So there was that division, basically the broad river that we know today. Fortunately, there's no more division on the broad river between the north and south of the broad river. Uh, I just want you to know that they're the Stone Age people. And, and anyway, the, um, the embassy um, were ch chafed in this, in, in this trade, and the Indian traders, the English Indian traders were a pretty scrupulous lot, unscrupulous lot, I should say. Um, and one of the things that they did is they used to take Native American families as prisoners in payment of debt. This is not unknown in Europe either, but um, it aggravated the Native Americans. I mean, you have to imagine the MC War going off into the woods for weeks at a time to gather um, deer skin, coming back and finding that his family had been absconded with it and was a slave. And sometimes some of them, a few, were sold into the West Indies, which is particularly rigorous. So there were all there was all sorts of hostility building up, and. Let me, let me, uh, and, and during all the, this period between 1707 and 1715, which is the date I'm trying to get to if I can, um, there occurred a great war, a great Indian war in North Carolina, very influential, nearly destroyed the, ta the uh, town of New Bern and the early settlers of North Carolina. And it was perpetrated by the Tuscarora Indians, known as the Tuscarora War. When North Carolina was destitute, and uh, they asked Virginia to send them help in the form of soldiers and arms to drive the Tuscarora away from the settlement. And Virginia said, no, it's too expensive. We won't do that. And then they sent word to South Carolina. And South Carolina said, OK, we'll send a little army up there, and we'll help you fight the Tuscarora Indians. So the little army was led by Colonel John Barnwell, subsequently known in history as Tuscarora Jack because of these events. And he went up and he smote the Tuscarora Indians and drove them back. They are Iroquois Indians from upstate New York, and he drove them back to upstate New York. And he did it with an army of Yamasee Indians. It was an episode in that war. It was kind of telling of the Yamasee. Well, there was they, the, the Tuscarora had built a star fort in the middle of the North Carolina Pine Forest outside of New Bern. It was a formidable military structure. Indians couldn't do that. They, they got an escaped slave from Virginia who knew how to do that. But um, Barnwell, he was an army, he was a colonel, trained in military, said, well, let's just lay siege to the, the Tuscarora Fort. And the embassy looked at him and said, we don't have time for this. Um, why don't we just run through the door of the fort and kill the Tuscaroras? <laughs> so they did. <laughs> and I mean, this is what the embassy were like. They were, they were ferocious warriors. And after, and, and after the, uh, the battle at the Tuscarora Fort, if you go to New Bern, North Carolina, just east of North Carolina, there, there are two town, little hamlets up there, one called Tuscarora and one called Barnwell Fort, named for the Tuscarora War of 1711. Well, that's how Tuscarora Jack, the founder of Beaufort, got his name, because he was the hero of the uh, Tuscarora War, mainly because he led an army of Yemsee in North Carolina. Um, in any case, uh, after that, relations between the whites and the Indians deteriorated in this neighborhood. And the um, Yemassee decided that they would cook up a conspiracy to settle all their debts in a single stroke. They sent delegations out to the Creek Indian villages in Georgia, those were the Lower Creek, and the Creek Indian villages in Alabama, those were the Upper Creek. Um, and the chief character um, of the Creek Nation at that time is a fellow named Emperor Brims of Kuwaita. And Emperor Brims was a powerful man. And um, all the tribes, many of the uh, Indian tribes, would follow his lead. And he had a war leader named Cherokee. Cherokee uh, means Cherokee killer. So these were tough people. But um, so this grand conspiracy of the forest developed without the English really knowing about 
Um, they got wind of this in, in uh, April of 1715, and they sent a delegation down to the chief Yemisi village of Pocatalgo to try and make peace with them. Uh, the delegation was led by Captain Thomas Nairn, one of the founders of Buford, and one of the first land grantees on the Sea Island down here, the land grant, grant receivers, sorry. Um, so the, the, uh, at the, the parlay, or the powwow of Ed Pocatalico, on, April, on Fr Good Friday, April 15, 1750, the traders there and the negotiators of the South Carolina government at the village of Pocadalgo trying to calm down the Amazon woke up to the frightening scene of the entire male of, uh, company of the um, Yamasee tribe dressed, dressed, uh, dressed in war paint. They painted themselves with red and black rays, their whole bodies, to represent blood and death. Well, all the traders and most of the, the uh, Englishmen in the village knew exactly what that meant. And so the war, the uh, Yemisee descended on the traders and their families and killed them all. Uh, Thomas Nairn, they held for a number of days and uh, submitted him to excruciating torture before he died after so. If you want to understand how he died, go to his grave, or the grave of his widow, at uh, St. Andrew's Church, Old St. Andrew's Church, on the on West Ashley section of Charleston. Find her grave and it'll describe how, he di how her husband died in 1715. But he was one of the founders of Buford, and um, one of the leaders of the Indian trade, and one of the leaders of the colony at the time. Um, and he, and uh, he had traveled way far west in the, pursuit of the Indian trade as, as Colonel, as Dr. Henry Woodward had done before him, almost to the Mississippi River. And um, so South Carolina lost some of its leaders on one day. And only, uh, there are two Englishmen who escaped, one a boy who hid in the swamp and made it to Jacksonboro um, and brought word, but he didn't get to Jacksonboro until the Indians had long passed him. He simply escaped and survived. The other was a guy named Seymour Burroughs, Captain Seymour Burroughs. And he got to, he opened his cottage, or his hut's door, and he saw the Indians at the door at dawn. They liked to attack just before dawn. He knew exactly what it meant. And rather than cowering in his hut, which would have been normal, he ran at the Indians. He was a big man. And he ran at the Indians, he knocked them over, and he ran into the Pocadalago River, and he dove for his life. And they shot him with their muskets as he ran away. And the musket ball went through the back of his neck and exited his teeth, knocking his teeth out of the front of his body. He lived with that wound. Swam the Pocatalago River to the uh, plantation on the north end of Port Royal Island, owned by John Barnwell. Uh, Tuscarora Jack, and he sent riders across Port Royal Island, and they brought word of the Indian uprising. And all white people, 300 white people living on Port Royal Island at the time, it was overcrowded, you know. They had to do something about it. Um, and they all uh, fled to Beaufort, and in the harbor to our left was a ship that had been confiscated for um, smuggling, and it had cannons on it, and it was a stout vessel. And so 300 people crowded aboard this ship and watched the native, and watched this Yamasi sweep into town, burn the town, open up. Another group of Yamasi left Pocatalago that same morning and swept into Colleton County across the Cumbee River, uh, probably at the Salkahatchee Crossing, and uh, swept across Colleton County where isolated plantations were attacked and um, Literally hundreds of white people were killed, male, men, women, and children. Uh, this was the opening salvo of the Yamasee War. At the same time that the attack on Good Friday 1715 occurred, they had sent messengers out to Kuwita and to the other Creek villages in, um, in Georgia and eventually in Alabama. And they rose up at the same time, and if there were English traders in their villages, they got this treatment of the stone axe in the head. And uh, so they killed English traders all across the frontier, and they lit up the frontier 
and the object of the uh, of the Creek Indian conspiracy in the Yamasee War was to drive it was to attack Charleston and drive the English into the sea to end the Carolina colony. They came very close to doing exactly that. Um, in April, on April 23rd, uh, the South Carolina militia under Governor Charles Craven reorganized itself, marched out from Pocatalago, and met the embassy in what's called the Salkahatchee fight. We think we know where the Salkahatchee fight occurred now, but we'll defer to Chester on that after the in the Q and A. Um, but it was near the near where 17A crosses the Salkahatchee River, near the confluence of the Cumbie and the Salkahatchee which was a standard colonial crossing. Um, and the, the Carolinians uh, were almost surrounded by the Yamasee who attacked coming out of the swamp. But they held their ground, and they beat the Yamasee back, and they won the battle of the, the, uh, the Salkahatchee fight. And the Yamasee disappeared into the, uh, into the swamps. At the same time that Governor Craven was confronting the warriors of the Yamasee tribe, probably 200 warriors in the Yamasee tribe at the time, two or three hundred. Um, Colonel John Barnwell, Tuscarora Jack, um, and Captain Seymour Burroughs, the guy that had survived the massacre, um, got the Port Royal militia into boats and went up the Port Royal River to Pocatalago. And they burned the village of Pocatalago and the Indian village of Tamatli. <coughs> And when the warriors came out of the swamp and back to their village, they found them burned and their families gone. So the Yemisee, after these events, retreated to their former homeland on the coast of Georgia. But that was, that was just the beginning of the Yemisee War. Um, in in um, May of 1715, a group of Charleston militia were marching up to the Congaree Fort. Let's see if we have a map of that. that might it's right there. You see the Congaree Fort up there? Yes. Congaree Fort is at the confluence of the Broad and the Saluda Rivers uh, and near the, where the Watery River makes the Santee. That's where the city of Columbia is today. And that was the center of a uh, of trading pass. You go west from Congaree Fort to uh, the Creek Country you go north of the Congaree Fort to the Catawba country, and you go northwest into the Cherokee country. So this was a, a central trading route. And uh, the militia that was going up to that region was attacked by the Native Americans, the Santees and, and the Congarees, and massacred. Um, and so the militia retreated to Charleston. And by the summer, by June of 1715, um, the whole colony of South Carolina was reduced to a ring of forts about 30 miles around Charleston. Uh, at the same time, in the summer of 1715, the Indians of the northern frontier, uh, the Santee frontier, these were watery Indians and uh, parts of the Catawba tribe, attacked the plantations up there, and those people were massacred or fled. So South Carolina was in desperate circumstances in the summer of 1715. and. Um, the Yamasee Indians who had been defeated went back to Georgia, and in this desperate moment, um, several South Carolinians and 1,200 South Carolina militia decided to march to the Cherokee country to try and get the Cherokee on their side, which they did. But it was a very risky thing. They could have been attacked, they could have been massacred, but they marched pretty close, to, they marched up the Savannah River. They went up to what is now Augusta and then up the Savannah River into the Cherokee country, negotiated with the Cherokee. And um, the Cherokee sided with the English, attacked the Creek warriors that had been tracking them in the woods, and opened a war with the Creeks. The Creeks, uh, by 1718, the Creek Indians, Emperor Brims of Coweta and Cherokee Leakey and the head of the the, uh, yet the Creek tribes of Alabama, or the Upper Creeks, who was known as the Conjurer of the Tallapoosas. Imagine this, these characters, if you can, the Conjurer of the Tallapoosas. In any case, the, these Native Americans, um, with the Cherokee siding with the English of Carolina, decided it was best to stop. And Emperor Brims then made a peace treaty, and the English, um, 
and the and he blamed the embassy for the entire episode. So the embassy had retreated to Georgia, but they continued to raid into south of the Sea Islands. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of African slaves here, but if there were, they took them because they could get money for African slaves in Florida with the Spaniards. They could get arms and ammunition, and the Spaniards continued to supply the embassy. Uh, faced with this, the, the treaty was in 1718, and that's often considered the end of the Embassy War. False, it went on for another 12 years. Um, the Embassy Indians uh, then retreated to Florida. Well, they were attacked in 1719 by a group of waterborne scouts, Carolina scouts, from uh, this area led by Tuscarora Jack Barnwell. Let's see if we can... Oh, there's a picture of the Salkahatchee fight. I'm not doing the technology, <coughs> but uh, that's an actual period picture of the Salkahatchee fight, and that's Governor Craven with a hat on. <coughs> that's the Conger report. Here, um, what developed during the uh, latter stages of the MC War was a group, uh, a group of soldiers, sailors really, called the Carolina Scouts. And they patrolled the inland passage between here and Florida in these boats, Carolina Scout boats. They had 12-man crew. They were armed with muskets and pikes and swivel guns that you can see on these vessels. The vessels had sails, but were mainly propelled by oars. They were pretty effective coastal vessels, particularly effective against uh, Yamasee canoes. There's an example of this. In August of 1750, a Yamasee war party crossed the Tybee Roads into this, uh, the Inland Passage of South Carolina, uh, past a place that we call today Bloody Point. Well, here's why. Um, the Carolina Scouts laid a trap for the embassy. They knew they could see them coming across in their war canoes. So they, they hid a company of men in the bushes at Bloody Point in Defusky. And they left a scout boat up the creek out of sight of the embassy war canoes with its swivel guns. And the commander of the scout boat was Captain John Palmer. We'll talk more about him as the story goes on. And the story does go on. And, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, this was known as the Defusky fight of August 1715. And when the, in, the in, in those days, there was no intercoastal waterway. So if you wanted to go from the Inland Pass from South Carolina to Georgia, you had to cross, had to cross Tybee Roads in pretty good weather over to Tybee Island. Then you went to a place over there in Georgia called St. Augustine Creek. Have you ever seen it? It's the route to St. Augustine. And um, it's behind Port Pulaski. So the Native Americans were coming across. The uh, English, the Carolina Scouts knew they were coming. And um, they were attacked by the scout boat. When they were attacked by the scout boat, they landed their canoes, ran into the woods, and were demolished by the fire from the company, the Carolina scouts hiding in the woods. So Carolina won that battle, but it was just the beginning of the war. Um, in any case, this group, uh, th these forces traversed the intercoastal waterway trying to stop the uh, raids of the Yamasee Indians, who were supported by the Spaniards in Florida. Let's see here. Oh, that's a good map. Um, this shows the debatable land. This shows Florida territory. This shows Carolina, uh, English Carolina, and the land in between. Um, and it also of the Carolina Scouts. And um, he decided that it was what they had to do. They made a, he made a treaty with the, with the Embassy Indians in 1720. He raided down there in 1719. He destroyed their villages in, on the Altamaha River. He drove them back into Spanish Florida and made a treaty. As long as he was alive, the treaty worked, but he only lived four more years. Now in the interim, he traveled to England and he uh, met with the Board of Trade, which was the king's uh, agency for controlling the colonies. And he convinced the British, the royal government, that they should take over the Carolina colony in order to protect the English position in the American Southeast. Basically, he said, if you don't defend South Carolina, 
Uh, and if you don't send royal troops to defend South Carolina, then um, Carolina is finished, and this will either be Spanish territory or French territory. Now let me back up a second. If you look on the map down there in the Gulf Coast, um, the French had settled Mobile in 1702, Mobile and Biloxi in the French Coast. They didn't settle New Orleans until 1718 after the war, <coughs> at the end of the war. But they had already settled in Mobile, and when the war started, they were instigating the upper creeks. And they built Fort Toulouse, which you can see there. Fort Toulouse is probably somewhere near Montgomery, Alabama. So South Carolina was nearly encircled by Spanish forces in Florida and French forces in Alabama and headed towards Tennessee. Um, and it was that circumstance, strategic circumstance, that sent uh, Colonel John Tuscarora Jack Barnwell to England with a plan to defend the English foothold, at the tenuous English foothold in Carolina. And his plan was to build a ring of forts starting from the middle coast of Georgia, that's Fort King George on that map, and going all the way up into the mountains. The only one of the forts of the Barnwell plan, and, and the, and the, the uh, Privy Council, accept, the, the Board of Trade accepted, and the Privy Council, the King's Council, both accepted Barnwell's plan. And they sent royal troops with Barnwell back, and a royal governor, General Nicholson, a friend of Tuscarora Jack. And so the colony began to shift from a proprietary colony, which it had been, to a royal colony, which it soon became. And the proximate cause of that political shift, shift in South Carolina history was the Emsey War, the attack of the Emsey Indians, and the peril that the English foothold of Carolina was in, in 1715, 18, 19, 20. Um, but the Barnwell Plan of 1720 uh, was successful because he came back with a few English troops, he came back with promise from the English government to settle it, and he came back with enough money to build a fort on the coast of Georgia. So he went down to Darien, Georgia, and he built Fort King George, and that was the genesis of the colony of Georgia. Um, and Fort King George, if you ever go to Darien, go to the fort, look out the, the lookout, you can see all the way to St. Simon's Island, and you can see the inland passage, you know when somebody's coming up from Florida. And that was the reason it was there. All of this was promising. There was peace, there was the extension of English trade, and Barnwell was its leader. But he died at the age of 54 in 1724. And when he died, the embassy, now ensconced near St. Augustine, Florida, and under the protection and supplied by the Spanish government, began a series of raids again into South Carolina. 1726, they raided the Sea Islands. They captured slaves, which they sold in, um, in Spanish Florida. They captured uh, white folks, which they held for ransom. And in, um, in, I mean, I'm just looking for the dates, you know? It's the way you organize things. Um, <coughs> Well, I'll make it up. <laughs> uh, in 1726, in, it, um, the scout boat crew was on Defusky Island. And they were surprised by a group of Yamasee Indians and their war canoes. Evidently, they weren't paying close attention. And the Carolina scout boat, this Carolina scout crew was massacred, and their captain, Barnabas Gilbert, <laughs> who was uh, a vestryman of the church across the street was captured, taken to St. Augustine, and held for ransom. Um, the, the Battle of Bloody Point in 1726 uh, prompted the English government to conclude that the only way to stop the embassy raids was to send an expedition to Florida to attack St. Augustine, to destroy the embassy villages around St. Augustine, to cower the Spanish government maybe to conquer the great Castillo San Marcos and St. Augustine. So the man uh, chosen to organize the raid into Florida in 1728, in February of 1728, was Colonel John Palmer. Now, Colonel John Palmer was one of the heroes of the Embassy War. When Tuscarora Jack attacked Pocatalago and Tomatley, um, John Palmer 
jumped over, climbed over the wall, of the, the palisade wall of the uh, Yemisee fort, and uh, drove the Yemisee out. And, and they drove him out, and he jumped over again and, and attacked them again. Um, he was a brave fellow. He was the hero of the Tefusky fight of August 1715. He was the hero of the, of the burning of Pocatalogo in 1715. And now he was chosen as the senior leader of the Carolina Scouts and the senior military official in the southern frontier of Carolina uh, to lead the expedition against St. Augustine in 1728. So he did. He got all the way to the walls of the Castillo San Marcos. The Spanish army couldn't stop him. He burned the Yamasee villages. Um, he destroyed part of the town. But he had no cannons, he had no siege guns, he had no big ships. This, this was a small army of men in, in, in galleys, in these longboats. Um, and it was a very successful trip because it ended the Yemisee War. The Yemisee raids stopped. The Yemisee realized that they could not be defended by the Spanish government, and so they disappeared into the swamps of Florida. And over time, other Creek Indians fleeing English expansion in Georgia and Alabama fled to Florida, formed a Native American confederacy known by the Creek Indian word for runaway or vagabond. What word is that? Seminole, exactly. That's what became of our Native Americans. They have not signed a treaty with the United States government to this day. So we're still fighting the Amazon Indians. Uh, the, last, uh, the last recorded tribe, and, uh, the last recorded uh, mention of the Yamasee as a separate tribe in Florida, now Chester may correct this, was, that I found was in 1820 on the, on the Peninsula of St. Petersburg, where there was a little village identified um, as a Yemisee village. But basically, they were absorbed by the larger group of Appalachians and Coetas and other Creek Indian tribes that went into Florida and became the Seminoles. Um, and that would be the end of the story in the Yem end of the Yemisee War. <laughs> Except for this. The Yemisee, um, they didn't forget their enemies. They tended to fight personal battles. Even in battle, they can, in other words, they would attack not as a group, but they would pick out one person, and the warrior would go after that one person. Well, the guy they hated was Colonel John Palm. And in 1740, in order to, because of many disturbances in Carolina, mainly having to do with the Spanish asiento, allowing freedom for escaped slaves in South Carolina, in Spanish Florida. Um, and the beginning of the War of Jenkins here, you know the story about the War of Jenkins here? Captain Robert Jenkins, he was an Englishman who was trading in Spanish territory illegally and he was captured by a Spanish guard of Costa named Emiliano Fandino. Everybody knows about Jenkins, they don't know about Fandino. But in order to prevent him from coming back and to make an example, they cut off his ear. Well, the Spaniards were kind of polite, so they gave him his ear back in a mahogany box. So he sailed back to England, and he went before the English Parliament, and he said the Spaniards are barbarians, and to prove it, he, he was presenting to, uh, to the, the Parliament, and he opened the mahogany box, and he showed his ear to the English Parliament. They said, oh my God, that's terrible, we'll start a war. So they declared war on the Spaniards. No new history is the War of Jenkins' Year. <laughs> and the, during the War of Jenkins, 1739, 1744, during the War of Jenkins here, uh, the Georgia, Georgia had been founded in 1733, and General Oglethorpe of Georgia said, we're going to wipe out this nasty nest of Spaniards. So he organized an army of Carolinians and Georgians, and they uh, besieged St. Augustine in 1740. And it said, oh, let's see if we can find the map of that. This is there we are. See, there's St. Augustine, the inlet. Um, and the, the Castillo San Marcos right next to the inlet. And to the north of it, I can't even read that here. Um, there's a place called Nombre de Dios. And let's see if we can find a map that's better than this. Oh, that's good enough. Um, there was a village established north of St. Augustine called um, Grossirel Santa Teresa de Mosa. Well, the English couldn't say Rossi Real, Santa Teresa de Mosa. <laughs> so in the English records, it's known as Fort Musa, 
Well, it was a village of freed slaves. Slaves who had escaped from South Carolina, gone to Florida, sought the protection of the Roman Catholic Church, had become free. And they built them their own fortified village north of St. Augustine. They also enlisted many of these escaped slaves into the Spanish army. Um, and so they became part of the garrison of the forts that protected St. Augustine. Well, during uh, Oglethorpe's siege of St. Augustine in 1740, he sent an expedition ashore to take that strategic location north of, of the Castillo San Marcos. And the Carolina scouts, led by Colonel John Palmer, and a group of Scottish Highlanders took the fort and occupied it. And there they were, and apparently the Scots Highlanders, who were supposed to be keeping watch during the night, had a little bit too much drink of their own uskibau, and they didn't pay attention. So early in the morning, in 1740, um, the Spanish army and, so, and Indians described in the English records as Yemisei or at least referred to as Yemsi, um, attacked Fort Musa and massacred the Scots Highlanders and massacred the Carolina Scouts and killed Colonel John Palmer, the guy who had ended the Yemsi War. They got even. And that probably was the real footnote to the end of the Yemsi War. And I only tell you that story about the siege of Fort, or the attack on Fort Musa because Colonel John Palmer is my eighth great grandfather, and I still resent it. <laughs> so the MC Indians, um, they had their revenge and pretty much disappeared from history. But if you want to know what became of them, they're part of the Seminole Confederation. That's what became of them. But now here's the significance of this Yemisee War. Uh, it was a very, as they said at the, in the at the time, it was a close fought thing. This is great. That's great. Um, so we're back to the beginning. You can see how South Carolina was ringed by these Native American groups. Pretty, there were, at the height of the war, there were 9,000 Creek, uh, warrior, Creek warriors uh, arrayed against 1,200 South Carolina militia. So it really was, as they say, a close fought thing. South Carolina was lucky to survive the assault of the Creek Indians and the Yamasee Indians in the Yamasee War. Now, had they succeeded, which they nearly did, either the Spanish would have claimed Carolina, and we'd be speaking Spanish today, or more likely because of the political circumstances of the 18th century, the French would have seized the Atlantic coast, and we'd be speaking French today. It changed the whole, it determined the course of the American Southeast and it didn't have to happen that way. So the Yemisee War was one of the most consequential events in colonial American history, and like all of American history, it began in Beaver County. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will entertain questions and get Chester to answer them. <laughs> So anybody, yes sir, hey John, how are you? Hey, this is famous novelist John Warley here, my friend. Oh, please. Yeah. So John, this is, this is oh, let, let me say something, because John's a novelist. This is for him, but for all of us. Everybody knows who William Gilmore Sims is. If you don't know who William Go Gilmore Sims is, he was the James Fenimore Cooper of the South. He was one of the most famous and widely read novelists of the 19th century. Does anybody know what his, his best-selling novel was, John? The Yemisee. The Yemisee. It's called The Yemisee, oh, published yeah. in 1835. In other words, in 1835, uh, South Carolinians knew the importance of this event, that they barely survived. Excuse me, John, go ahead. Uh, how, how much support is there for the theory that the Spanish and the French were the, were the powers behind the Indians stimulating the attack. Thank you very much. Lots of support. Uh, now, in the English records, they accused the Spaniards and the French of instigating the, uh, the Yemisee War. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is a question that Jester and some of, uh, many of us, and perhaps Larry Ivers, who wrote this book, 
could reflect on. My opinion is that this was a particular grievance of the Creek or Muscogee Indians with the English traders who were among them. And that it wasn't necessarily, it might have been encouraged, it was certainly encouraged by the Spaniards in the later uh, stages of the war. And it may have been encouraged by the French who were moving into the same region as the English in Alabama and were very aggressive in the trade and could provide for the Native Americans the same manufactured goods that the English did. So they were great competitors, but the records seem to indicate that the Native Americans were really mad at the English and they were just going to get even. And they took help where they could get it, but it came after the fact. Um, in any case, it's a great question, and, it, and it's, it goes to the point that had this close-fought thing gone the other way, had the Yemisee taken the Jacksonboro Fort, had the Congarese taken the forts of the Santee and invaded Charleston, had they driven the, the Carolinians into the sea and they sailed off to some safe place like Haiti, you know, in the, in the West Indies, um, the whole history of the North American continent would have been different. It was a, it was a close fought thing, but it was probably their own, um, they, were, they were seeking their own settlements is what they were doing, not necessarily relying on the French and the, and the Spaniards. But that's my opinion. Who else? <clears throat> yes, sir. Do historians know what was provided to or committed to the Cherokee Indians to convince them to attack the Creek Indians? Oh, yeah, we have lots of records of what. Did it take a lot to convince them? Or? No, you know, it took a lot, sure. Uh, but the Cherokee were traditional enemies of the Creeks. So to, to one degree or another, it really didn't take that much. It, it did in that episode uh, in the fall of seven, in the spring of 17, uh, 17, Chester, spring of 1717, um, the, the Carolinians were powwowing with the, with the uh, Cherokee and the upper Savannah River region, somewhere near Clemson University, <laughs> up there. And um, uh, they, they fell upon the Cherokee. I mean, they fell upon the Creek Indian Wars who were monitoring all this from the forest they were there and um, they were looking for their own revenge um, so it it took commitments it was it was the Cherokee also wanted the English trade so that was the agreement I mean that was the understanding and the Cherokee and the English trade went on till the American Revolution it was very strong Cherokee were a large tribe the Creek could fund it could um, field about 9,000 warriors. The Cherokee, as thought, could, could uh, field as many as 15,000 warriors. So it was a numerous group, and it changed the tide of the war. Um, and there were certainly exchanges and gifts and promises um, for, for what it was worth. But the Cherokee had their own rights with the Creeks. Good, all good questions. Yes, sir. What about the Battle of Bloody March, what was the year on that? Yeah, 1744. Uh, 17, 1742. 1742. So that's, uh, you know, that's a, an episode of the War of Jagatia, a different war. Um, and the, the Yemisee, except for the attack on Fort Musa, Native Americans weren't all that involved. They were parts of both armies. But what had happened there? is that uh, Frederica, Georgia was one of the earliest settlements of Georgia. It's across the marsh from Fort, uh, Prince Fort King George. I mean, you can see Frederica from Fort King George and vice versa. Um, and so the Oglethorpe had settled, but, and it was kind of the southern boundary of occupied Georgia at the time, settled Georgia. And the Spaniards, uh, this was during the War of Jenkins, the Spaniards didn't organize a fleet in Havana. And guess what they were going to do? They were going to sail into Port Royal Sound. Why would they do that? Because it's the deepest natural harbor right. between New York and Key West. They knew it. Spaniards knew it before anybody else. And it was undefended. Nobody had that idea after that, did they? <laughs> so they were going to sail this, this uh, fleet of Spanish galleons into uh, Port Royal Sound. And they were going to ask all the, they were going to invite all the slaves to overthrow their masters and flee to the Spanish fleet for freedom. 
Seattle slaves. Boy, that's a dumb idea, isn't it? No, it might have worked. In fact, Beaufort was evacuated because of it. But the Spanish fleet decided that they would stop at St. Simon's Sound and eliminate a pesky group of Georgians and, uh, who were at Frederick. And they landed an army and the English independent company down there and the Georgia militia uh, attacked the army on its flanks and defeated the Spaniards at the Battle of Bloody Marsh. Is that what you asked about, the Battle of Bloody Marsh? And that was the Battle of Bloody Marsh. And uh, um, one of the heroes was Lieutenant Delegal, who was uh, commander of the independent company from Fort Frederick, uh, out on the grounds of the Naval Hospital. But he had moved uh, down, to the Georgia, down to the Georgia coast. Um, and the, uh, the Spaniards, the Spanish fleet in St. Simons and the Spanish army on St. Simons Island, they decided to pack up and go home. So Oglethorpe got even for the failure at St. Augustine four years, two years before, and the Georgians saved South Carolinians, saved South Carolina, saved Port Royal Sound from uh, probably a successful attack by a Spanish fleet. So that's the battle. But that was different. It's the later war. It's the later war. There's, there's a constant war, I mean, for 60 years, nearly a century, between English Charleston and Spanish St. Augustine. Mm. Back and forth, and back and forth. And Battle of Bloody Marsh was one of the key events in that century long contest for the Southeast. But the Yamasee War was the biggest and most consequential event in, um, in that struggle for the control of the Southeastern United States. So, good questions, all of them. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Each of those blobs is a few hundred thousand square miles, maybe a million square miles. And, and you said the population of Creeks was like 9,000? Well, they could, they could mount 9,000 Creek warriors, which they're about triple that population. Okay. So were they concentrated in small groups of a few hundred, got together from the dispersed area, or were they, did they all live in one place? No, no. They, they had some big villages and a lot of small villages. Um, you have to understand, these are Stone Age people that depended on the forest for their food. So you have a large population, you can't support it. So they didn't have large villages. They had a series of small villages. So um, for them to put together a force of 9,000 people, they had to travel far and wide yes, sir. to coordinate a whole lot of... Yes, sir. <coughs> but the Native Americans in that day traveled far and wide very quickly. They ran, through, I'll tell you one story, they ran through the forest. They would run through the forest. And uh, they knew where they were going, where we would be lost, and they aren't, weren't. So uh, Dr. Henry Woodward, who really founded the Indian trade, went almost to the Mississippi River, and he died out there someplace in Alabama. Uh, this was uh, 1679, A1680. Um, and the Creek Indian Wars respected him, and they knew that it was important to the English to get Dr. Henry Woodward, the first settler of Carolina. When you go to your museum in the arsenal, look over the arch in the arsenal, that bronze plaque. This is Dr. Henry Woodward. He was left here by the English voyages before Charleston was settled. So he was, uh, has the place in history of being the first English settler of Carolina. And he founded the English trade, and he died out there in the West someplace, and six Creek Indian warriors from Alabama put his body on a litter and ran through the forest in four days. Never stopped running until they got to Charleston and delivered his body to Charleston. Wow. This is the kind of thing they did. I mean, they were remarkable athletes. The Europeans point that they could run forever. They could swim. The English couldn't even swim, and they'd just jump in the river, grab a log, and travel miles down the river. Um, so they were used to the forest, but they were Stone Age people who didn't have a lot of agriculture and didn't have a lot of capacity to feed large populations. A lot of interesting stories. I mean, we have a professional archaeologist and ethnographer here, so I, I'm getting out of my hip. Chester will correct me. But uh, what I, from what I had read, adult female Native Americans had an average of two live births in their life. That's just maintaining the population. 
And they knew how to prevent that. And they knew how to end pregnancy. And um, they did that because they, didn't, they couldn't guarantee a food supply to feed a large population. They didn't have agriculture. It wasn't like Egypt or Mesopotamia. So it was just a different world. But uh, it's a good question. They, so they lived in relatively small groups in numerous relatively small villages. Yes, ma'am. What made a Spanish Florida, specifically St. Augustine, a place that attracted runaway Indians and runaway slaves? Really good question, because, yeah. uh, you know, for a hundred years, the Spaniards were too nice to Native Americans. Um, now, I can tell you about the slave, because that's a very interesting story. But the Native Americans went there by default. In other words, the Spaniards might not have been good to them, but they were better than the English. And that's about the only answer. Because the Spaniards didn't have the capacity that the French and the English did to provide goods for the trade. But they, did, they could provide a, a degree of safety for a while, and they did. Now, the, sl the slaves ran away to St. Augustine for multiple reasons, mainly. They didn't want to be slaves. What a surprise, you know. Um, and there was, a whole, there was a whole underground railway from the coast of South Carolina to, to um, St. Augustine in the 18th, early 18th century. It was driven partly by the Asiento. It, it started in the 1690s when South Carolinians went to Florida <coughs> to try and get some escaped slaves back and treat them with the Spaniards. The Spaniards said, no, no, they're under protection. They've taken the catechism. They're under protection of the Roman Catholic Church. Go away. Thank you very much. So this word reached back to the slave grapevine of the plantations and brave slaves would slip away and escape in ones and twos and fives. And um, if they made it safely to Florida by the Asiento of 1733 um, and took the catechism, became, took, sought the protection of the Roman Catholic Church and worked for the state for four years, they were free. And um, they could receive land rest, I mean, they don't have to um, So it became known among the slave populations of the South Carolina coast that, uh, South, that Florida was a refuge. There's another interesting part of that. Um, and that is that one third of all the slaves who came to South Carolina in the 18th century were from the region of Africa known today as Angola. That's where the term Gulf come from, in Gulf, and apostrophe G-U-L-H. There are different theories about this, but mine is right, of course. <laughs> um, and it's not my theory, it's Lorenzo Dow Turner's original theory. And um, slaves came from a lot of places, but at least a third were brought here from Portuguese Luanda. And um, many of those slaves were baptized before they left, by Portuguese priests, Catholic priests, before they left Africa. So they had a little knowledge of Catholicism. They had a little knowledge part of a language close to Spanish. And the word circulated through the grapevine. And uh, hundreds, thousands of slaves ran away singly and in pairs from South Carolina to Florida. And they formed uh, this group at uh, Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Bosa. And they formed, uh, really in the 18th century, the backbone of the Spanish army in Florida. Um, and Florida was a refuge for uh, runaway Africans. Um, it's, a, it's a great story. And there are some individual stories within it. The captain who led the counterattack uh, of the Spanish army at Fort Musa uh, in 1740 was a guy named Captain Pedro Menendez. He was an escaped African. So this is a story untold. You know, I mean, the, first, the Underground Railway to Canada was not the first. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's an, and it was part of what uh, roiled the frontier and kept the war between Charleston and St. Augustine going for nearly 100 years. Great question. Thank you. What else? Yes, sir. Um, Larry, did not uh, Tuscarora Jack considered the father, or at least uh, had, had a big play in the township scheme for South Carolina? Yes. Uh, the Barnum's plan of 1720 anticipated the, the township scheme. So what he was going to do, what he told the, the Board of Trade and the Privy Council in England he wanted to do, was build forts through the central Georgia and then uh, grant the land to settlers around those forts. 
This is what they call in Texas an empresario, you know. Um, it's the way you settle the ground. Uh, now, he, he never did build all, he wanted to build forts all the way from the Altamaha River up to the mountains. Well, he only got one built, and there were no land grants down there. And then the G Georgia and South Carolina fought over the land south. I mean, it's a very, very complicated story. But that was the whole plan, is to, is to uh, settle people around the forts. Um, you can write American history by uh, listening to the land. And the way you do that, or the way you think about that chronologically, is the land was occupied by hunters in order. Hunters, herders, surveyors, and farmers. Just think about those differences. And you understand how the world changed. And, and you just place when you started placing uh, lines on the land the way surveyors did, you changed the life of the woodsmen, of the hunters that lived there. You know? So that was the conflict of the MSC War, a lot of them. Who else? Yes, ma'am. This is one other question. I noticed the name Tuscarora Jack Barnwell. Yes. He was mentioned as a hero or a warrior mm -hmm. or a leader in a lot of these fights. I have a question for Mr. Worley. Yeah. Is he the author of Home Guard? Yes, he is. Yeah. You are a distant relation to Tuscarora Jack Barnwell, aren't you? I am his grandson. Yeah, I love your novel. <laughs> I think it's, and Larry, that's not a question, but it's a statement. I thank you for bringing that up. I think it's a, a, a testament to the continuity of Buford, Buford's history that we have a seven generation grandson of Tuscarora Jack, that would be me, yes. and an eighth generation grandson of John Palmer in the same room talking about the same war they fought in. Yes, he's also, right? We got one right here too. Yeah. yeah, there's the Sams over there. He's their direct <laughs> descendants of the Farnwells, too. Yes. Um, yes, indeed. So we're all in this together. As Walter Edgar described South Carolina, it's a vast cousinage. So we're all in this <laughs> And really, if you, read, if you read South Carolina history, it doesn't. It, that crosses color lines, too. You know? In other words, we are really all cousins. You're all intermarried. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what else, y'all? Yes, ma'am. My understanding is, after the Battle of Bloody Marsh, uh, the Spanish retreated from the, the, those debatable lands. And then, what caused Saint Augustine to do not to recede in history, as far as uh, Spanish? Yeah, they lost them. Uh, they they were on the wrong side of the war of, uh, of the Seven Years' War in Europe. Uh, that's called the French and Indian War in America. Down here, it's called the, the Saint Augustine Carolina War. <laughs> I mean, that's what it was. This was a front in that war. And so, uh, at the end, we never, incidentally, the Castillo San Marcos, which I recommend to all of you, because my eighth great grandfather has a plaque down there. Um, the, the Castillo San Marcos was very powerful. It was never conquered by uh, opposing forces, it was given up by the Treaty of Paris in 1763. And then the English occupied it for a number of years. And then the Spanish got it back, and then the Americans bought it. You know, we bought Florida, built condominiums, and the rest of the system. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it was ceded, St. Augustine was ceded to the English in the Treaty of Paris of 1763 at the end of the uh, Seven Years' War. It was ceded to the English? Yes. There was an English period of Florida history from 1763 to 1783. And then it was seated in the, the second treaty. This is confusing, but the, the war that ended, the treaty that ended the American Revolution was the Treaty of Paris. It's the second one. And in that Treaty of Paris, um, Florida was ceded back to the Spaniards. Well, what are you going to say? And then in 1819, by the uh, Adams Onus Treaty. Am I right about that, Chester? Was that. Uh, um, at any rate, it was uh, it was sold to the Americans. Florida was sold to the Americans, and uh, it was already settled by people from Georgia. We just went down there. To, you know how Georgia is. <laughs> I just went down there. To the but uh, there's a whole story. If you go, if you read the Gulf Coast, the history of the Gulf Coast, 
um, or the history of Louisiana, uh, you find that there's a great conflict in the early years of the early republic over who, could own, who owned and controlled that land. And eventually it was settled in 1819. The Americans took over. Um, but it took that long. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, if you'd like to stay and chat, we have Chester, we have Steve, we have Larry. Uh, so if you'd like to stay and chat, we'd be glad to have you do so as well. Thank you for joining. Bye.